Hello fellow translators. I, I seriously need a better intro than hello fellow translators. But anyway, hello fellow translators, hello fellow freelance translators. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the ATA. I'm going to be talking to you about some issues I have with the ATA. So let's get into it. Now for those of you who don't know, the ATA, the American Translators Association, is an association for translators in America. It is uh, the main association for translators in the United States, and it has various different chapters. I used to be a member of the ATA. I'm not anymore. I am currently a member of one of the chapters of where I live. And uh, that's basically how it works. Now, I've been to several ATA conferences or conferences sponsored by ATA, like the main ones for the whole country or state ones and stuff like that. I've also... Obviously, while I was a member, I followed a lot of what they did. I've uh, attended various conferences, webinars, you know, other things like that. I'm by no means an expert, and there are plenty of people out there who have more experience than I do with the ATA. But I've had my little bit of experience, and I have some serious issues with it, and so that's what I wanted to cover today. First of all, I should say some good things. I think uh, Translators Association is needed because it helps translators help themselves and, and speak for themselves and speak up for themselves and kind of get together and discuss what issues are going on. I do think something should be geared more toward freelance translators, which nowadays is most translators anyway, but the ATA I think hasn't made that move yet. And so that's what I'm going to get into now. The first issue I have with freelance translators is, well, actually it's precisely this. It's run by people who've been in the business maybe for 20 plus years. These are the ones who you know, are making the speeches, who are running it and, uh, and are kind of at the head of the ATA. And uh, let's face it, their careers are very different from the careers of people who are starting off now. None of these people really made their bones on pros.com. They never had to start their career, never had to get it going online really. And I think the vast majority of them, if not all of them, basically started working for an agency, maybe going out for themselves and poaching some, you know, taking some clients from that agency and setting up their own thing. And then gradually they started finding stuff online and doing business there, if they did at all. Or they started in their hometown and started having random clients, basically people in their hometown, and they built it up that way. Now this was the classical way and the way it was always done until about 20 years ago or so. Nowadays it's very different. Nowadays if you want to be a translator, you're going to pros.com, you're going to Translators Cafe, you're going online and trying to search for people. You start off as a freelance translator, not as an in-house translator, not as someone who can walk around and visit various people and bring home the translation, work on it at home, and then deliver it by hand. It's a very different world. And I think this is not reflected right now in the ATA and a lot of what they talk about. And I just hear it uh, just... I mean, just by their speeches and what they say, I've, I feel they have very little familiarity with Pros or Translators Cafe or any of their other websites that are up there. And uh, they don't really know how it works and they don't know about a lot of the issues that come up. So as a case in point, at the last ATA meeting I was in, the main keynote speaker there was talking about prices and saying we can't charge these uh, low prices because it, uh, it's bad for the industry and it's bad for all the other translators. And I agree with this. We shouldn't charge low prices in general. There are other reasons I think you shouldn't do it. One of the people asked, well, what do we do about it? Like if people are saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to charge a lower price because I want to get that job, what should we tell them? And she's like, well, just try to educate them and tell them, look, this isn't good for translators as a whole. It isn't good for our industry as a whole. So you shouldn't be doing this. And to me, that seems sort of ridiculous because if someone is starting off and they're not making any money and they need to make money and they say, well, I'll do this for cheap, and you're telling them, no, this is bad for the industry. It's bad for all of us in the industry, so don't do that. The guy's like, what, what's he going to reply? You know, he's going to say, well, I need to put food on my table. I need to worry about making my living. I feel bad for all of you in the industry, but I need to figure out what I need to do. And I think it just shows, uh, uh, I don't want to say a lack of understanding, but sort of, yeah, a lack of understanding of how it is to work online and to have to figure this stuff out. By the way, as I've mentioned before, I am still against charging a low salary because I think it's bad for you in the long term. It, it pigeonholes you into that salary range and it's very hard to leave that salary range. This can be a method, but it, it can be very iffy. There are a lot of traps in it, let's say, and a lot of things that can go wrong. And so that's why, in, in general, I don't recommend it too much. But the arguments they were giving, I feel like they've never had that experience of 
wondering, should I charge very little per word just to, uh, to make some money because some money is better than nothing and I'm competing against all these people online, like how do I do that? And so, yeah, that's just my impression. Anyway, uh, I, I feel it's very apparent that they haven't made their bones online. They haven't had to build their career from scratch by going online and trying to network online and find new clients online, do marketing and sales and everything online. And I think that very much shows. They kind of grew up in a different world, if you will. I'm not the youngest person around by any means, and I'm sure my experience is different from many of you, but I had to do everything online, basically, and I'm still trying to do stuff online, and be also because I want to stay entrenched in that world and, and learn about it a bit more. Let's talk about some more issues uh, that I've had with them. Another issue that I've had is I feel they are quite apologetic sometimes. I feel like all these issues are sort of tied in, but because another thing that came up at the, at, it's come up at a couple conferences I've been to is uh, the fact that a lot of clients say, oh, nowadays with Google Translate, we don't need translators. Then they say, how do we explain, how do we educate people, possible clients, potential clients, that they need translators, that we are useful and we're relevant? And, it, and the answers were all sort of like, well, you need to educate them. You need to let them know that, uh, yes, they could use Google Translate, but they won't have a very good quality website. And uh, we can provide a lot more quality. Even if the machine translation becomes better and better, it really helps to have the personal touch because we understand them and where they're coming from and all that. Now, all of this is true, absolutely 100% true, but I feel like it's quite apologetic as well. And to me, when... If a client comes and says, well, I don't think I want to hire you because I want to use Google Translate, I mean, I'll, I'll be like, okay, use Google Translate. I mean, but then I reserve the right to, after you've translated your website, to put it on one of those Facebook groups where, you know, you make fun of bad translations. You, you've all seen them with a bad, badly translated menus or shop signs or whatever. Well, uh, you're definitely going to have issues like that if you use Google Translate and you don't know what the hell you're doing. And by the way, your homepage is one thing, but if you're using Google Translate for your internal documentation, well, guess what? None of your information is, uh, is private anymore because as soon as you put it on Google Translate, it's out there and it's available and can be accessed by pretty much anyone. And I've covered this before in other videos. It doesn't translate anything it sells. It just, it just learns from what it sees. So as soon as you plug anything into Google Translate, it uh, can retrieve it later on and in fact other people can and they can even retrieve the IP address of who put it up and when and everything so and yeah that many times you do kind of need to educate people on because they don't know it a lot of translators don't even know that and um, and that's why it's very dangerous to use Google Translate I mean it's another reason why it's dangerous to use but I just felt like you don't need to be that apologetic when you talk to clients and again this once again might just be my impression but I feel like it comes from not having to build your career online. Sorry, they're doing construction right next door. I don't know if you can hear that. Okay, so, but it comes from not being able to relate to people who are trying to build their career online. And, uh, and I think it just shows that for various issues like that. And the one last issue that I have, and this probably is not ATA as a whole, but it's definitely for my chapter, Katie the Carolina Association of Translators and Interpreters. Great group of people, but they're all, all 100% interpreters. I think the last time I was there, it was me, and there was one other person who's a translator, but she wasn't a translator yet. She wanted to become a translator. I was literally the only translator there, I think. And uh, the meeting before that, I think there was one other translator um, as well. Otherwise, they're all interpreters, and it's all geared toward interpreting. In fact, the last one I went to, a guy even asked me, he's like, what are you doing here? They're all interpreters. Like, why did you come here? What benefit are you getting? And, um, and that's kind of annoying sometimes. Uh, but again, I think that's just my local chapter because when I went to the ATA meetings, like the ones where, uh, where the whole country goes, I definitely ran into other translators. So they're definitely out there. But uh, be careful about your local translation association because it might just be interpreters, even though it's the ATA. I mean, I guess my, mine is Katie, translators and interpreters. So interpreters is there in the name. So I should take that into account. But it also has translators in the name. So it would be nice to see a couple other translators at some point. But anyway, those are my issues with the ATA. And as you can see, they all kind of tie into 
sort of the same thing. I think it's a, it, almost a generational thing, really. And I hate to say that because actually I'm probably the same age as a lot of them, but I got started into translation a bit later. So I had to start with prose and with Translators Cafe and all that. And I think a lot of what they were talking about and what they talk about in these sessions isn't all that relevant to me anymore because, let's face it, they the one who did the keynote speech, I checked she runs her agency now and their agency charges like 50 cents a word, which, I mean, I run a boutique agency and I, I couldn't charge that even if I wanted to. Uh, you know, I can't remember, it's 45 or 50 cents a word. It's something a lot higher than what I can do. And uh, it's, uh, you know, so I feel like at that point she can't relate to people who are wondering if they should charge two to three cents a word, right? And if that's viable and doable and if they should do it just to earn something and maybe try to build up their resume or whatever it might be. So anyway, hopefully you find this useful. And uh, once again, this pertains only to my experience with the ATA, not the ATA as a whole, definitely not other translation associations as a whole. Uh, but these are just my impressions that I felt. Uh, please feel free to let me know if you agree. And a big reason why I say this is because I know each country has its own translation association, and I assume in each country it's people who are roughly the same that are doing this, because in many countries, working online and getting jobs online came even later than the States, and so it's a relatively new thing. So I feel like a lot of people might not be able to relate as much. So anyway, feel free to let me know your thoughts on this. Uh, I'd be curious to hear about them because this is kind of the first time I brought them up. I obviously didn't bring them up in any of the ATA meetings, um, even though I probably could have with people around me. But uh, again, I kind of just thought about them later after attending these meetings. They, they just came to my mind. Um, there are a lot of good points, like I said, of the ATA and of all their subsidiaries, and I can do another video where I speak more about those, but I kind of wanted to get these off my chest first. So yes, please feel free to let me know any comments, any issues, any points of view that you might have because uh, I'd love to hear about them. And otherwise, I will talk to you next time. Okay, thanks. Bye. Sabedum.